Hello, everyone, and welcome to another preview show. This is, of course, the special one, the Giro d'Italia, the 104th edition. As ever, I'm joined by Mr. Corico himself, Ewan. How are you, Ewan? And why is the Giro d'Italia special for you? Benvenuti a tutti, and welcome to this year's Giro d'Italia preview show. I love the Giro. The fight for pink is my favorite grand tour of the year i love the pink jersey it's a beautiful jersey to wear and this year it looks to be extra extra tough and with a pretty wide open field this year no real clear-cut favorites per se it's definitely going to be a good one this race is absolutely steep in history you've got the biggest cyclists of the sport so without further ado let's move into our history clip the Giro d'Italia first ran in 1909 when the race both started and ended in the city of Milan. Milan is where you can find the headquarters of the race's organizer, Gazzetta dello Sport, known for its unique pink pages. That edition was won by Italy's Luigi Ganna. La Corsa Rosa will go on to become one of cycling's most illustrious races, always taking place in the springtime. As the race grew, so did the peloton taking part, as 1951 marked the first time a rider from outside Italy won the Giro. On that occasion, it was the Swiss rider Uyo Kobli. When we look at the statistics of the race, Fiorenzo Magni is the oldest Giro winner at 34 years old, whilst Giro legend Fausto Coppi is the youngest winner at 20 years old. On top of this feat, Coppi holds the record for the most wins in this race with five pink jerseys. That is also the same amount as Italy's Alfredo Binder and the cannibal himself, Eddie Merckx. In recent years, the Giro has never failed to push the boundaries of Grand Tour racing, hosting La Grande Partenza in the most elaborate locations, including Ireland and Israel. So anyways, Ewan, we have talked about the route in depth, but can you just give us an overview of what the riders have to tackle at this year's Giro d'Italia? Well, this year's edition of the Giro will start in the city of Turin. We have a time trial there. Before we head off on to the course, in total, we have six sprint stages, five hill stages and seven mountain stages, six of which are at a summit finish. And also, we will end this race at a time trial in Milan. So this looks like a very interesting route. It's mainly concentrated in the north of Italy, but we have some stellar stages on the agenda, most notably stage 11, which is the Strada Bianca stage from Perugia to Montalcino, where we will see 35 kilometers of gravel roads. Stage 14 is also a summit finish to the iconic Monte Zoncolan in the north of Italy, back in the Dolomites. The day after as well, we have a little excursion into Slovenia, yes, the home nation of Tadej Pogacar and also Primoz Roglic. Stage 16 to Cortina d'Ampezzo will feature the highest point in this race. And the final couple of days will all take place in the Alps. We have a summit finish to Sega di Alla and also to Alpe Mota. So this final week of racing is very, very difficult. We have many, many mountain stages on the agenda and it could all come down to that final stage in Milan. So anyways, as it's a grand tour, we're going to do it a bit different. We're going to look at first the favourites and then the outsiders. And when we're looking at the favourites, where best to start with than the last year's supreme team that did absolutely incredible. They aren't bringing Theo Gegenhardt, and I am, of course, talking about Ineos Grandiers. They're bringing a phenomenally strong team, headed up by Egon Bernal, Ivan Souza, Filippo Ghana, Danny Martinez, Gianni Moscon, Puccio, and Pavel Sivakov. You and this is one of the strongest teams in terms of young talent of this generation. Exactly that. This Ineos Grenadiers team is absolutely formidable. Yes, Egan has many questions to answer. We've covered it before on the channel. And... I'm not 100% sure if Egan can finish the job this year. He's pulled out of some races due to his back problems. He's been diagnosed with spinal scoliosis after the Tour de France. And scoliosis, it's a painful old problem. And Bernal to ride three weeks of a Grand Tour with such a difficult final week may prove to be a bridge too far for this young Colombian. And... If you look outside of Bernal in this team, we have Daniel Martinez, who has been suffering with injury as well. But he looked absolutely formidable and very, very strong at the UAE Tour early this year. He revved up the Jebel Hafit and he really ripped that race to shreds. I'd really like to see the Dauphiné champion roll the dice here at, at the Giro d'Italia, especially on his first time of participation. We also have the Colombian Ivan Sosa, winner of Tour de la Provence. But I'm more interested in Pavel Sivakov, the man who was actually born in Italy. and. 
he rode the race before. He's the only one out of these top riders to have ridden the Giro d'Italia before, back in 2019. He had a good run there. It was a very, very tough race there with a tough final week. And Sivakov has a proven track record at the Giro. So my eyes will be firmly set on the Russian to do something special on this race. So you mentioned this in the video we did about Egan Bernal, but the way that they divided the team up with the English speakers going to the Tour de France. And now we're seeing Garan Thomas recently won the Tour de Romandie. So it's like, it's almost like they should have somehow winded Garan Thomas into this team. And also when you're considering around 40 kilometers of time trialing, but do you think Garan Thomas would have been a useful addition to this team instead of the likes of maybe Pavel Sivakov or even Egan Bernal? I think Garan Thomas would have been a safer leader than Bernal. Even Theo Gegenhardt should have gone to the Giro instead of the Tour de France this year but nevertheless I do think it is still a good team they've got many cards to play maybe too many cards to play they've got four potential leaders on the plate here so it's going to be a big ask for Ineos to organize themselves and to not have ego battles and the other big problem here is that people Ghana could take pink early on Ineos will then have to control the race maybe and take up the duties of race leader which I think will be inconvenient seeing as Puccio Moscon and Ghana are the only guys for the flats really so it could be difficult for Ineos they might be victims of their very own success. So anyways, one of the big stories of this Giro, we have made a video about it, of course, but focusing on the whole story and not just the one rider, De Koenig Quickstep have transformed into a GC team by the looks of it. That we're used to seeing them competing for the sprints, for the stage for victories in the mountains, but from breakaways or so forth. But yeah, De Koenig Quickstep bringing Remco Evenepoel first ever Grand Tour. Joao Almeida is coming back to the Giro after his very exuberant performance last year where he actually stole much of the show. Like when you think the 2020 Giro d'Italia, I think Joao Almeida in pink. I don't think of Theo Gegenhardt in pink. We've also got Remy Cavagna who recently won a stage for a Romandie. Miguel Honore is coming back to the Giro d'Italia for the third time and James Knox is here Fausto Masnada and Peter Siri and Ilio Kaiser so Ewan what do you make of this team and this is this the new kind of quick step that we're going to have to get used to seeing the more classification orientated team I've circled a couple of names on this start list to say I think this is a Grand Tour winning team. And the Koenig Quickstep is one. The one question is their leaders. But if you look at the way that the team is structured, we have Afnapol and Almeida as co-leaders maybe. Then you have a strong time trialist in the former Remy Cavagna who might even challenge Pipo Ghana. He managed to beat him the other day at uh, Romandie. We have Miguel Honoré, who's a man who's very talented in the hills, fresh from victory at the Copi Ibartali. We have James Knox, the British rider who was a very useful asset to Joao Almeida last year, who has come very close to getting a Grand Tour top 10 on his own in the past. And Fausto Masnada as well, third place at Romandie general classification. He looked very good there and also a final mountain supporter in the form of Peter Seri. But this team needs a, a road captain. There's a lot of young names. Masnada, Knox, Honoré, Cavagna Almeida, and Avenapol. All of those guys are under 28 years of age. But we have Ilio Kesa here. Ilio Kesa is in his 30s. He has won Grand Tour stages in the past. He's ridden so many Grand Tours. He knows cycling at the back of his palm. He's been involved in every generation of this sport that's currently riding in the peloton. So I think this team is absolutely perfect in terms of its structure and the riders they picked. But in terms of Avenapol and Almeida, Avenapol hasn't ridden since his injury. Lots of question marks there. But obviously his numbers are good enough in training to warrant a position at the Giro d'Italia. This year's route involves two time trials. It's not as much as he'd hoped for, but the former European time trial champion is certainly going to look forward to that prologue and final day time trial in Milan. Joao Almeida has a proven record at a Grand Tour, fourth place last year at, at the Giro. And it was a well-warranted fourth place. He didn't ride it flippantly. He was up there in the mountains and on some of the hardest days of that race, he was still present. He only lost it a little bit when Rowan Dennis came to the front and ripped the judo to shreds. So this is definitely a team that can win this judo. It just depends whether Avenapol or Almeida can finish the job. I don't think it's going to be Avenapol. I'll say it now. I think Almeida is going to be the leader of this team. He's ridden this year. He's managed to get some good results at Tireno. Also, at the UAE tour and he was mixing with some big names there and some of the favorites here so I think Almeida is the man to choose for them. Avnapol could be a 
massive wild card though. Who knows what Avonapol is going to do? And the one thing against Avonapol here is that we only have four days of racing until we get to the first proper GC challenge to Sestola. So Avonapol is not going to have the time to ride himself into racing shape again. It's going to come at him straight away. So that's the situation for the Koenig quick step. And the road is going to talk. The road is going to decide who is going to be the leader. Nevertheless, let's switch our attention to a team that has won the Giro in the past. They won it with Vincenzo Nibali and they are back to win it again with Alexander Vlasov. Yes, I'm talking about Astana Premier Tech. And for reinforcements, they have Gorka Izagire, Fabio Fellini, Samuela Battistella, Vadim Pronsky, a rider I've never heard of from Kazakhstan, Spanish champion Luis Leon Sanchez, Matteo Sobrero of Italy, and finally the young Colombian Harold Tejada. So, Scott, what do you think about Astana's chances at this year's Corso Rosa? Well, as you know, I'm a big fan of Russian riders. It's really interesting that they're giving the opportunity to Alexander Vlasov. We saw him in the Vuelta España last year. He just missed out on top 10. And he actually did the Giro d'Italia, his first Grand Tour, but he had to pull out, unfortunately, because of an injury. So, yeah, this is going to be his first, hopefully, completed Giro d'Italia. I mean, his form has been very good this year. He finished 10th in the Tour de la Province. So he probably should have finished higher. He was higher last year, finishing behind Nairo Quintana in the Paris Nice this year he finished second winning the young riders classification most recently the tour of the alps he finished on the podium so i think in terms of his form it's definitely there whether or not he can survive a grand tour and not have any bad luck uh, that that remains to be seen but that goes for any rider yeah i'm i'm really really looking forward to uh, seeing what he can do and looking at the team there aren't really anyone who's going to be challenging him for the leadership you've got Luis Leon Sanchez but he'll probably go in a breakaway so he well he, he's never gone for GC in a grand tour so yeah I think this is this is literally Astana trying to see how far Vlasov can actually do and now he's learned from his uh, mistakes in the World to España last year and then yeah I think this year he could definitely maybe even get in top five exactly that and this year's Giro d'Italia it's weighted very much in the final week and if you watch the Walter Espana, Vlasov was very, very strong in the final week of racing. So this year's Giro could favor Alexander Vlasov. The one question mark is whether he can sustain it over the proper three weeks of the 21 stages. The last year's Walter was, what, 17 stages? But certainly Astana have a very, very good chance of getting a podium here. So anyways, moving on to one of the most exciting teams in Ewan's opinion, Bahrain Victorious. And Ewan, why exactly do you think Bahrain Victorious are the team to beat at this year's Giro d'Italia? Well, when, when I was talking about the Kerne Quickstep, I mentioned Grand Tour winning teams. This is the other one that I, I can see as a Grand Tour winning team. You have Mikael Lander, a phenomenal Grand Tour rider. Look at his record in the past. I think he's the only person in this current field with a past record like that. Many people didn't talk about him last year at the Tour de France, and he managed to get fourth place. He got sixth at the Tour de France 2019, fourth at the Giro in 2019 as well. That's just in his last Grand Tours that he started. Mikael Lander is a phenomenal Grand Tour force, and I cannot see him finishing outside of the top five at this year's Giro d'Italia. If you look at the reinforcements he has, Peo Bilbao, who had a very good run last year, the current Spanish time trial champion. You have Damiano Caruso, who finished in the top 10 at last year's Tour de France, and he's a fantastic, fantastic climber and helper. So much experience for him. He's been in this game for years. Gino Merda is a young rider coming here to build on experience and try to get his place in future Grand Tour teams. And same for Domin Novak, who was actually very useful in the final week of the Judo last year. And let's not forget, we have a flat road captain in the form of Jan Tratnik and also Matej Mohoric, who's definitely going to be there on the Helia days. Mikael Landa has the ultimate team to support him. Bahrain have been very, very good at getting top 10s in Grand Tours under the radar. And I think this is going to be another top 10 for him. If you look at the contenders here, we have what Vlasov, we have Afnopol, Almeida, Bernal, Mark Celeb, George Bennett, whoever, all of those guys. Lanza is very good at the final week of racing. He can ride a three-week race consistently and very strongly. He's very good at these mountains. And if you look at the similarities between this year's race and the 2015 Giro d'Italia, it's stark where we have blocks of mountains there and Mikael Lander managed to perform throughout these blocks of mountain stages. So I have all my faith in this Basque rider 
He's ridden a lot of the climbs on this year's course, and I think he is undoubtedly the hot favorite to win this year's Giro d'Italia and to take the pink jersey in Milan. So moving on, last year's second place finisher riding for Sunweb, Jide Hindley, and in that team, you've also gone Roman Bardet, which is very interesting after his move from AG2R. So Ewan, do you think Jide Hindley will be able to capture that form? A lot of people were surprised that he managed to even get on the podium and even wore pink and took a stage win. Yeah, Hindley has always been quite good, but did I ever think he would finish on the podium of the Giro last year? No, not at all. And for a man that finished second on the Giro last year, he's been almost absent from the front of a race ever since. He got a top 10 at a stage to La Colmiane, the mountain stage at Paris-Nice. Okay, that's quite good. But if you look at the people he lost to, Tish Benoit, Lucas Hamilton, even the Hannover von Hauke, these guys will not finish on the podium of a Grand Tour, let alone content for it. So Jai Hindley, I have many question marks about him. Roman Bardet, I think, is slowly getting back and back into his better shape. Ninth at Tour of the Alps with a couple of top tens in stages there. Eighth at Tideno Adriatico, a strong finish at Strada Bianca. We could see the revival of Roman Bardet here. I think he has a good chance to prove himself. He's experienced, a lot more experienced than a lot of the riders on the start list. And I know it's his first Giro, but I think he's, he's still in with a chance at making a top 10. And I would love to see Roman Bardet back at the front of a bike race. It feels like a long time since we seen him content and he had so much expectation on his shoulders at the Tour de France the pressure is a lot less now that he's starting at, at the Giro so maybe this could be the year that we see the 30 year old Frenchman come back into form last but not least we also have Simon Yates coming here with Team Bike Exchange and he was seen as the favorite last year after winning Torino Adriatico but unfortunately had to pull out after contracting COVID. He has been looking very strong and similar to last year, he has won an Italian state race before starting the Giro Italia, this time with Tour of the Alps. And he even did quite well in the Treno Adriatico where he was the only rider who was able to somewhat follow Tadej Pogaccia at the Pranto Tivo. But Ewan, do you think Simon Yates, we've seen him win stages in the past, wear pink and then spectacularly crack? He has won the Vuelta Espana, of course, but do you think he has a realistic chance of taking pink this year? Well, in terms of form, he's finished in top 10 at those races that you mentioned. And Simon Yates is the perfect one-week stage racer, just like his brother. Is Simon Yates the perfect three-week racer? No, he's not. He has finished on the podium just once in his career. That was at the Vuelta 2018, when many riders seemed to crack at that race. Nevertheless, whenever... Simon Yates comes into a Grand Tour as a hot favourite and on lightning hot form like he did in 2019, in 2020. It just seems to not work out in his favour. And I think this year might be the same. Simon Yates is very good probably at riding this, this first week of racing. It suits him quite well. Whether he can get over the Strada Bianca and then contend that final week, I don't know. He seemed to struggle in 2019 at the middle point of the race. And I think he could struggle again this year. I know he is the bookie's favourite. He's the man with the shortest odds right now. But the team he has here, they're okay. We have Kangut, we have Kamaya, Mikel Nieve. Those guys are going to be good support in the mountains, but it's not the best team bike exchange could have fielded. And when Yates is their all-out leader, maybe... I know Esteban Chavez is having a revival, but Yates should have the strongest team possible for bike exchange, but they're not here in the start list and they're going to struggle when they're competing against Bahrain, against Ineos and the Koenig Quickstep. So I wish him the best of luck, but I don't think it's going to be the year for the man from Bury in England. So anyways, when we look at outsiders, where best to start, Dan, with Israel's startup nation who are bringing Dan Martin here. And Dan Martin is, of course, famous for his 2014 Giro d'Italia, where he unfortunately crashed in the team time trial. Obviously, that's not the only thing he's done in his career. But do you think Dan Martin has a realistic chance of getting in the top 10? Yes, I've heard a lot of things about Dan Martin, saying that he could be a good outsider here. He's been very consistent throughout this year. He's had some good results throughout the year. I don't know if he's bound for, for, for a good result here. When it came to the mountain stage at the Tour of the Alps, he managed to get on the podium beating Vlasov and Jai Hindley there. So he obviously has some legs on him. I think Dan Martin could be present nonetheless. We didn't expect much of him at last year's Welter and he managed to contend that one. So I'm feeling optimistic as such. He's got 
Pat Bevin on the start list with him, Alessandro Demarchi, Chris Nalons. It's a weak Israel Startup Nation team. I think Michael Woods be, would have been better suited to start this race instead of Dan Martin. Who knows? I think Dan Martin is bound to surprise. He manages to, to sneak into top 10 on many occasions, and this year could be the same one. Anyways, let's change our attention to Jumbo Visma. The boys in the yellow and black of the Dutch team are back here at this year's Giro d'Italia, not with Primoz Roglic, not with Wild Van Aert. No, they're here with the current New Zealand road race champion, George Bennett, and also a headline grabber. It's the return of Dylan Runeveke back to the professional peloton. And Scott, what do you think about this team? They're coming here with George Bennett, Eduardo Affini, Kun Bauman, David Decker, Tobias Foss, Dylan Runeveke, Paul Martins, and Jos von Emde. What do you think they can do? Looking at this Jombo Visma team, uh, it's a very disjointed team, as in They've got a mix of a few climbers and then also looking like they're committing more for the sprints. And uh, George Bennett, well, we know he finished 12th in the Vuelta España last year while he was still working for Primoz Roglic. But I don't know if he can actually get into the top 10 or even challenge. And what happens if suddenly George Bennett is on supreme form and then gets into pink? But he clearly isn't because then they would have built a stronger team around him. Uh, we we both thought that they should have picked a certain Danish rider in this team to give him the chance of a leadership and maybe a less focus on the sprints. But this is the team they're coming with. They've also got the current defending Tour de Lavenir champion, Tobias Voss, because we still haven't had an addition since he won. Uh, maybe he'll be able to build on his experience from last year. Don't know. But George Bennett is clearly the outsider for the top 10 that they're going for. And maybe the New Zealand road race champion can actually do something not being chained to Primus Roglic. But Ewan, what do you think of George Bennett's chances at this year's Giro Decider? I think George Bennett could maybe get ninth, eighth, tenth in GC. Bennett has never really contended a Grand Tour. He has ridden a lot and he's managed to get low top tens in some but i don't think george bennett is a grand tour winner i don't think he's a grand tour podium finisher and judging on his form i don't think he's going to podium this judo d'italia in particular uh this team it feels lackluster i'm looking forward to seeing david decker and dylan hunaveke in the sprints nonetheless they have eduardo affini to to help them there in terms of a sprint train but i don't think this is yambo versus strongest team i don't think this is a dominant Jumbo Visma squad, like we're going to see in June and July later this year. So anyways, uh, one team that seems to always surprise us in Grand Tours is Trek Segafredo, and they are coming with a team surrounded, it seems, around Bauke Molema, but you've also got former Mountains Jersey winner Julio Ciccone here as well. So do you think these two riders are potential dark horses for a top finish at the Giro d'Italia? And I should just add, Bauke Molema, last time he was at the Giro, he actually finished in the top five. I think Balka Molima definitely could get a top five. I don't think it's a podium purely because he, he hasn't done that in the past. He did it once in 2011, but that was 10 years ago. He was 24 then. But Balka Molima has the experience needed to do well. He can ride a three-week race. He can top 10 a three-week race very comfortably. And he has the form that George Bennett does not. He has been getting top 10s across the board this season without anybody really hyping him up. An eighth place at Liège, 11 that La Flèche Wallonne. He managed to get top 10s and podiums at these smaller classics. Third place at Tour des Alpes Maritimes et Duval, including a stage win there. I think Balka Molema is a very strong contender for a top five. And if you look at the team here, Gianluca Brambilla, Giulia Ciccone, they're excellent teammates to have on the start list. And the Italian Trek Segafredo team, they're an exciting squad. They're very, very uh, feisty. So I think this could be a good chance for Balka Molema to prove himself. The Ciccone and Molema double act managed to work in 2019, and it could work again in 2021. So one of the standout performances of the 2020 season was in the Vuelta Espana, where the very tall man from Lancashire, that was Hugh Carthy, took the stage win on the Anglerou in front of many of the best climbers in the world. And he's coming in with EF Education, and they're also bringing some well it's basically a team of surprise packages it seems alberto Bechiol, 2019 ronda van Vlandren champion castedo who took a stage win last year the ecuadorian and ruben guerrero who won the blue jersey last year and uh tj van garderen with a lot of grand tour experience do you think this team is credible enough 
to aid Hugh Carthy for another podium or potentially a top five. That World Espana performance he did was very surprising and very impressive, to say the least. Yeah, Hugh Carthy is a rider that managed to get a podium. I don't think many of us uh, had expected it last year at, at the Welter when he took that fantastic stage. This is a team that is strong enough to support him. Guerrero is a very strong mountain helper. I particularly remember his performance at the Tudeno Adriatico last year helping Michael Woods. He was very useful there. I think he'll be useful yet again. TJ Van Garderen as well, back at the Giro. I'm great to see him here again. He won a stage here in 2017 and he could definitely be a, a good experienced supporter for the relatively young Hugh Carthy. Simon Carr is the wild card on the team, but Hugh Carthy, I think, could get a top 10. His form isn't quite stellar and as hot as some of the other contenders here, but Hugh Carthy is someone you have to keep your eye on for EF. He rode a very good Giro in 2019. He was visible throughout that race, and I think he's going to be visible here with that with that iconic pink jersey. Don't look past Hugh Carthy, and always keep an eye out for the men in pink. I'm sure they're going to be visible at the head of the peloton throughout this Giro Italia. So anyways, there is, of course, Emmanuel Buchmann as well to consider, and a uh, movie star coming with Mark Soler, but you and there's one name in particular you want to talk about and that is from UAE Team Emirates. Yes, well, UAE Team Emirates, they've just won a monument at Liège Baston Liège. They are the reigning Tour de France champions and a man who was on that Tour de France team and on that Liège team is David Formolo. He ripped the race to shreds on la côte au Rochefaucon and I think he could do it at the Giro d'Italia. He's got Valerio Conti, Joe Dombrowski, and Diego Ulisi to help him in the mountains. And Davide is someone who has managed to finish in the top 10 of the Giro in the past and of other Grand Tours. So I think he could definitely sneak into the top 10 under the radar. UAE are a team that now know how to ride Grand Tours. And Davide Formolo is on good enough form to challenge some of these guys. And with years of experience now under his belt, I wouldn't look past the Italian for UAE. So keep an eye out for him. He's managed to get a top 20 at Tireno supporting Tadej Pogacar. So watch out. Anyways, when we're looking towards the points classification, it's a very interesting battle that we have on our hands. And where best to start with last year's second place finisher that was, of course, Peter Sagan in his first ever Giro d'Italia. Do you think Peter Sagan can somehow come back to his routine of winning points classifications, Jersey? We don't have his routine program anymore such as Toro California doesn't exist anymore but do you think this is the year when Peter Sagan makes a small revival in his career? I think it could be a year where we see Sagan back. I don't think he'll be there for the Tour de France but I think the judo field it's weak enough where he can shine again. Following his performance at Romandie he looked good there he won a stage he was beaten by Maunus Courts later in the race in a sprint, but we'll look past that. Sagan as well, a win at Catalonia. I think he's definitely in with a shot at maybe getting a stage win and contending for the Ciclamino jersey. The threat is Caleb Ewan, whether he can stay here on the hilly stages, and also Tim Merlier, which we'll talk about in a second. But Sagan is the real hardy sprinter here. In terms of, 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 of Amalia Ciclamino, you do have to have some hill legs in you. Uh, he's got Cesare Benedetti here, a fantastic man to help on a lead out, and also Daniel Oss, his perpetual teammate. So this could be a strong team and a strong Malachi Clamino campaign for Sagan. Many third, fourth, fifth places could add up to a stint in that purple jersey. So anyways, the team that is very exciting with their first ever appearance at a Grand Tour, that is Alpecin Phoenix. They are, of course, not bringing the superstar Macho Van Paul. They are bringing Tim Mulia, who seems to be a rising star anyway in his own right. It seems that the team has largely been built around the Belgian sprinter. But Ewan, do you think this team has a credible bid for the points classification jersey or is it just purely taking stage wins? I think they could go for the Ciclamino if Tim Merlier contends the first couple of sprint stages. He's got more wins under his belt this year than many of the contenders on the start list. He won at Le Samin, the Rote Presse Jean-Pierre Monseret, the Coxeda Classic, and he got a third place at the Doise d'Or Flandre. So I am excited to see what Tim Merlier can do here. He's taken a big step up now to Grand Tour level sprinting, but we saw last year at Tireno know that he can still win World Tour race uh, sprints, and that was against Ackerman, Gaviria, and so forth. Uh, if you look at the team, it's got Dries de Bont by his side, Oscar Riesebeek, Gianni Vermeis, Louis Vodavaca. These are all guys that are going to be very, very useful in building a sprint train. And Alpes and Phoenix don't have any interest really outside of the sprints. So why not go for the Malia Ciclamino? It is the pinnacle of uh, sprinting at the Giro. Whether Merlier can beat Caleb Buen one-on-one on a flat sprint, I don't know. But at the moment... 
Merlier has more wins. So good battle to watch at this year's Judo. I mean, the only factor that really hampers Merlier with the points classification is that he's never done a Grand Tour. So he doesn't know how to keep inside the time cuts and, and so forth. So that's where possibly someone like Caleb Yoon is looking like a strong favorite. They are coming with a very supportive team of the Australian. Thomas de Gent is in there, who many will remember. He won the Stelvio stage back in the day, and he even finished on the podium in the Giro d'Italia, which now seems crazy. But other than that, we've also got Gino Marco Nizzolo, the current defending European and Italian road race champion. He's won it in the past, but with arguably a stronger team. And he hasn't really had the form this year. He Okay, he finished second in Gent Wevelgem, and Wout Van Aert is not here who beat him. Eighth in Skelter Priest, but it wasn't the strongest field well it was in terms of having Sam Bennett there but you had Mark Cavendish finishing third and Jasper Philipson taking the win so do you think realistically Gino Marco Nizzolo many people on the channel like Nizzolo but do you think he can actually do something here with Astros Quebecer? Yeah Giacomo Nizzolo is coming into this as the reigning Italian and European champion and He's won the points jersey twice here in the past. He's never taken a stage win, however. And I think that is a big sort of ceiling to break. He's never won a, a, a Grand Tour sprint either. So for Nizzolo, it's going to be it's gonna be a big step up. And in terms of his team, we have Max Valscheid as the lead out man. And the tall German's going to give massive wind resistance help to Giacomo Nizzolo. So we'll find out in due course. But this is probably a decent form for, for Nizzolo. He's been getting top 10s in multiple sprints already this year so who knows it, we, we could always see the european champion take a stage win here so other sprinters to look out for and actually former winners of the points classification Ilya viviani is here and also fernando gaviria so that should be very interesting to see if those two can actually try and revamp their career in to former glories that they had at quick step so anyways, now we come to our favorite part of the show. That is, of course, the prediction round. And here we're going to do the winner of every single jersey, but the top three of this year's Giro d'Italia. Well, anyways, our first prediction is going to be who's going to win the Malia Rosa. And just for context, this is a Giro d'Italia where we have no previous winners of the race. Jaid Hindley being the closest, finishing second, and then Mikael Lander third as well. But Ewan, I'll let you go first. What is your top three of the 2021 Giro d'Italia. Well, this one was very difficult to do. I think this is the most wide open we've seen a Giro in a while. I've gone for Almeida in third place, surely because of experience over Avenapol. Second place will go to Alexander Vlasov, and the winner will be Mika Landa of the Basque Country and of Bahrain Victorious. Copy paste whatever I said earlier and apply that to this. I think he is the man to win pink. So I put your winner in third place, which looking back at it, I shouldn't have. Second place, I have put Simon Yates to take his first podium at the Giro d'Italia. And then the winner, now I'm saying it, I probably regret doing this, but Egan Bernal is going to be the second Colombian to win at Giro d'Italia. So anyways, moving on to the Mountains jersey. This was last year won by Ruben Guerrero of EF Education and Ewan, who do you think is going to take the blue jersey this year? This was difficult to choose. Um, this is the hardest to predict because you don't know what's going to happen in terms of race scenarios. But I have gone for the rider from Group Armour, Francis Deja. That is Sébastien Reichenbach. Well, I've followed your French theme, but I'm going with the Giro d'Italia debutant that is Roman Bardet of DSM. He has, of course, won the polka dot jersey in the past. So anyways, for our points section, this was last year won by the imperious Arnaud Demar. Who do you think is going to take over the jersey from the French Comet? I know I was bigging up Tim earlier, but I think it's going to go to Caleb Ewan. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that one. Caleb Ewan as well. It'll be his first Grand Tour points classification in his career if he did that. And then last but not least, Young Riders classification, by default, I um, have to give it to Egan Bernal. But what about you, Ewan? And by default, mine has to be Alexander Vlasov, my second place overall. So anyways, of course, this is a grand tour, but we thought, why not have a bonus round in it? Anyways, so this week's bonus round is where will Adri Ponoma finish the young Ukrainian who's only 18 years old and will be starting his first year in Italia? Riding for Adroni Ducatoli. Well, he finished 34th at the recent Copi Ibartali, won, of course, by Jonas Vingegaard. 
and I think he's going to finish in 124th place. I think it's his first ever Grand Tour, so he will DNF. So that's it for this, our first Grand Tour preview of the Giro d'Italia. Remember, we are going to be running a competition with the help of Siegel Copenhagen, where all our special members of the channel can guess every single day their predictions on the videos and the overall winner of each week will get the very nice Mario Rosa edition of the Siegel Copenhagen t-shirt. As always, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel as we're going to be very active in this year's Giro d'Italia and thank you for watching and have a nice day.